That'll stir your heart a little, amen. We'll finish up in a few minutes with the Lord's Supper. That's a, that's a wonderful beginning and end to our gathering today in worship. Worship in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for singing out to the one who is worthy. Praise and honor unto thee. Join me in our text today, Luke number 10. Luke 10, we'll finish out Luke chapter number 10, and uh, we'll be around the Gospels, of course, on, on Sunday, this coming Sunday, Resurrection Sunday celebration, of course, uh, we'll be having a, a wonderful time, we do every Sunday, of course, but it'll be a special Sunday, extra special, because we'll have some extra music and have some narration that goes with the, the songs, the songs are beautiful. Listen to a few of them through uh, a platform, of course, to hear them. And uh, looking forward uh, to our celebration, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. You know, as you know, I say often we celebrate Resurrection Sunday every Sunday. It's the first day of the week. Uh, and uh, they went down there to the grave, and he, he's not there. He's not here. He's not here. And so... Uh, some would say, well, what kind of uh, message are you going to do on uh, Resurrection Sunday? Uh, duh. <laughs> are you going to put a new something on it? No, it's, but it's hearing just about what he has done for us. Life. He brought life that we might have life. That's a preview. I think we'll be doing that. The life. Jesus Christ, the life he brings. Remember when you were lost, you were darkness, no hope, you were dead in your own trespasses, the Bible says. There's none righteous, no, not one. The wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Someone showed you in the Bible, uh, your questions have answers, and Jesus is the answer. When he spoke of himself, um, in the Gospels, it was really clear that uh, he wasn't bashful about who he is. And he spoke it with love and grace. He spoke it with sternness and power, conviction and reproof. And that's a little hint of where we're headed today because our text today from verses 25 down through the end of the chapter show us how Jesus reproves. You say, well, you got the Good Samaritan. That's a great story. Yes, it is. Well, you've got the, the truth of how Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. Huh, that's, that's, the, that's the thing. The most important. Absolutely. But Jesus Christ in our text today reproved. He reproved two people, a lawyer and a servant, both of whom had enough religious background to know to do something may be different, but they did not. Maybe that's like you today. You've got some background, some church background, maybe religiously. Uh, maybe it's you today that you're born again. You know Jesus Christ as Savior. You called on the name of the Lord to save you. you. You know there was a point in time where you turned from yourself and you turned to Jesus Christ. The scriptures tell us. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Saved from what? The condemnation of your sinful state. Because Jesus himself said, I didn't come to condemn you because you're already condemned already. I did not come to judge you, but then, of course, it sounds like a contradiction later on in John's Gospel. He says that I came to judge. Well, he came to judge sin on the cross. And when he judged it all on the cross, we then had the door opened for us to come into knowing Jesus Christ as Savior. And it's very, very important to understand that in the text that we've been breaking into the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of St. Luke, that he, of course, is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's writing from his background in the setting of when he came to conversion, 
<clears throat> in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, we know that he was around that old guy named Apostle Paul and some others. And of course, he's now penning these words, and so much of it is an accounting of what he's been told by God and by others that Jesus Christ, in this text, chapter 9, chapter 10, really, really laid down really a heavier gauntlet for instruction and teaching and discipleship for his disciples. And he'll spend most of his physical journey in account historically doing something very strong and powerful that applies and can be applied to us spiritually that he's moving from and his, his last part of ministry, his last half year, few months, he's making his way to Jerusalem. And it kind of sets up nicely because what are we going to be speaking about? People, of course, talk about Good Friday when we know that he was not crucified on a Friday. Impossible to work out your scripture that way. And by the way, if you want to get a grasp on it, ask Bobby. He loves doing that. It's his fave. It's his all-time favorite. We might be having a video this week about it. I'm looking forward to it. Because the point in all of it is, is that that three days in the grave and up from the grave he arose and his resurrection was on the dawn of Sunday morning. It couldn't happen on Friday night. This is not possible. But we see here again, going back to Luke chapter number 10, that Jesus' Galilean ministry is coming to a close and he's making his way to Jerusalem. Why? To fulfill what he was come to earth for. He's come to seek and to save that which is lost, yes, but he's come to do his Father's will. His Father's will is to be the propitiation, the redemption, the sacrifice for our sins. And that's really what the setup is here in chapter number 9, late and 2 the mid part of Luke chapter number 19. As we have looked at a number of these scriptures the last few weeks, we have seen, and even including last week, that the disciples uh, and the people around, um, they really are hearing a bold message from Jesus. And they, many, are responding, going, yes, we'll follow you, Jesus. And there's many also that have excuses. Remember, we looked at those a little bit last week. You see, our excuses, if we were to make this a personal application, as disciples of Jesus, interrupt the incredible rewards that come from passionately serving him. I'm not just talking about the rewards one day. I'm talking about rewards like on a daily basis. Like that love, joy, peace. When I have excuses on not being a learner, I don't want to be a learner. I don't want to show up. I don't want to follow you today, Jesus. I don't want to learn from you and the Word of God. I don't want to learn and have the Holy Spirit teach me. Well, I'm missing out. We miss out on the incredible rewards. They come on a daily basis when we live that Spirit-filled life. Let's admit it. As we finished our message last week, no guts, no glory, let's admit we need God. We need the guts. We need guts. That came out pretty good. Yes, I slur words at times. You've noticed it. Let's admit we need guts. And really, those guts come from his grace. They come from his blessings and his gifts on a daily basis. He says, okay, now what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to give glory to myself. Oh, no, I, I want to give glory to God. We have to have those guts. No guts, no glory. That was, of course, our message last week. We even talked about the week before lip service and how we have lip service for people, yet we don't realize that that doesn't go very far. Lip service meets sacrifice, and that's where Jesus was challenging them at the end of Luke chapter number 9. Hey, no more lip service only. Let's get to a place where we sacrifice. You see, following Jesus Christ required serious responsibilities for the 12. And that's the text. He's speaking directly to them. He's speaking words of life to them. But we can, of course, today take this living word and go, okay, yeah, I can see how he was saying that to the disciples. That might hit me pretty good. You see, there's responsibilities for them. Well, there are responsibilities for us today. And if you look at all that the Church letters speak of, Gospels, Acts of the Apostles, the whole package of stuff. You see, wow, there's responsibility that befalls a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter how unattractive being a disciple 
really appears to be. Romans chapter number 8, real quick. Two seconds. Keep your finger right there. We'll come right back. Romans 8. I had this written down here somewhere. I don't know. Maybe I'm losing my brain cells. But I, it just comes to mind. It's a reminder. You know many of these. You know this verse. <sighs> Verse number 16, the Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. When you're born again, you're a child of God, you're the, in the spirit of adoption. We cry, Abba, Father, the whole relationship. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ, and we so be, so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. Verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings for this, of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That lines up beautifully with the truth of Jesus Christ's command, his, his oath that he wanted his disciples to, to take. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. I salute, yes, Jesus Christ, you are the captain, and I sign up. I call the name of the Lord to save me now. I'm a soldier. Okay, well, if you are... If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. That doesn't sound so attractive. But it doesn't have to be in a place where our senses, sensually speaking, it has to be something that is attractive. When in fact, it should be that Jesus is my attraction. And people see Jesus in me, so now there's an attraction to the Lord because of that. What does that mean then? Well, you're going to have a suffering time. Well, we know this. I mean, you will live a couple years, you know. You go, well, I can either suffer in this life in Jesus <laughs> with some rough times, or I can suffer in this life without walking with Jesus. The neat part about walking with Jesus is that when you deny yourself, take him across daily, and follow him, he says, hey, there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to go on that you're absolutely going to be fulfilled. And in fact, you're going to have a life's purpose. You're going to be completely fulfilled. Here's a quote from Dr. Constable. In view of this revelation, disciples of Jesus should, not, should feel encouraged to participate wholeheartedly and fully in God's mission for them. For us, that means participation in the execution of the Great Commission. No matter what time frame of where you were and where you are and where you're going to be as a believer in Christ, we are assigned to bring the good news of salvation to everyone. We are to sow seed. We're to be farmers. We're to bear fruit. We're supposed to be in a place where our fulfillment in life may include some sufferings. But it's going to be nothing compared to one day having that glory that will be revealed in us. On the other side of things, unfortunately, there are many who do not only question the way, truth, and life of Jesus Christ. They are looking for an alternative means to a purpose-filled life. That's kind of the way we're going to see a couple of people today. That's how God has developed our message time today. You see, Jesus is it. Jesus' journey as he's leaving Galilee, he, Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, maybe a couple, two or three times before he finally gets to Jerusalem, and now it's, it's crucifixion time. Luke, incredible focus. Yeah, he showed us some geography, but he didn't stop by on that geographical area as deeply as some of the others when you go to the synoptic view of those other three gospels, the other two gospels to put Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John together, you can say, okay, I got the context of things. I can see how it's formulating. For Luke, he's all about the people. He's all about the relationships. He's all about discipleship. He's all about the instruction of Jesus. There's more parables in gospel, Luke, Luke's gospel than any others. And he's bringing some really neat perspective for us in the Spirit of God. See, the words of Christ... The red letters, they correct us perfectly. They're perfect. They correct us. They center us back up. We read them and go, okay. There is no better instruction for the Christian life than from Jesus Christ himself. Duh. It's like next Sunday's message. What are you going to hear? Uh, the resurrection. 
We'll hear about it a little today, too, as we walk through the good news. So how do we handle when reproof comes? Because he, he corrects us. I've said it more than once over the years, youth ministry for 11 years, pastoring the church here for almost 12. I, I realize that some things I kind of repeat a little bit I, as part of senility and as part of just believing that some of those things are pretty important like this. Oftentimes, we don't want the reproof. I'll just put this out at you today as we get into our message. Having the reproof come from God's word, to me, even though it's tough, it's hard, it's, but it's right, is a whole lot better than getting it from someone that maybe you don't respect or honor as much. Is it actually possible that we don't read the word of God because we know that the scripture says it's given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction and in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. If I don't open it up, then I don't have to be concerned about being corrected. I don't have to be concerned about being reproved. You say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, so he's of course gonna speak to me in different ways, maybe by the fellowship of the saints. Well, wait a minute, I don't go to church and then I don't get any reproving. Maybe if I don't go to a Bible study, a small group, a men's group, a women's group, I don't go to any ministry thing, then, then, then I will not face any reproving. Today, just consider the setting. Jesus Christ has just spoken with his disciples just before this passage picks up. And it says in John, excuse me, Luke chapter number 10, that Jesus in verse 23 turned him into, into, unto his disciples and said privately, blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. Remember the 70 have come back, given an incredible report. He's got the 12 around him as well. Consider the setting. As this lawyer stands up before him. Consider the setting as he goes to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' house. In Bethany and consider that there's a lot of reproof going on our message today reproved by Jesus sometimes sometimes we don't like to be reproved we don't like to get called out I often have said with parents be careful that we don't correct our children without giving them some doctrine and reproof first. Similarly speaking, when you're discipling people, doctrine, reproof, they are two wonderful foundation blocks to build upon. That's what Jesus is giving them. But now here's a place of reproof. I'm going to reprove you. I'm going to point out some things to you. And I want you to know that you're going to have to fix some things person that I'm talking to. This is Jesus in the text. Let's read it. Reproved by Jesus. Let's pick it up in verse 25. We'll go down to the end of the chapter, and then we'll make a few lesson points to really support what we have here, which is, again, some incredibly strong words from Jesus Christ. Verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. He's testing him saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Keep in mind, a certain lawyer at the time would be like a scribe. They might even be just a teacher of the law. They might be a doctor of the law. So this lawyer isn't like, oh, it's, uh, you know, Mike's got this. This isn't Mike's got this, okay? This is a lawyer that is very familiar with the law. He knows the law. He's asking Jesus an an a question that he already knows the answer to. How does Jesus handle it? He wants to search out his spirit and heart. Verse 26, he said unto him, what is, that, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Sound like Deuteronomy to you? 
Yes? You say, well, Mark, and those aren't written yet, but Deuteronomy. This guy is a lawyer of the law. He says it, as Jesus said, thou hast answered right, this do, thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Wait a minute. You've taught the law. You know the law. You possibly are a doctor of the law. You're a scribe of the law. Oh, I'm not sure I know who the neighbor is. You know what he's doing. As it says in the text, justify himself. That's why Jesus is going to have to do some reproving. Verse 30, how does he reprove him? Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jericho to, excuse me, from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Don't you love the Samaritan, the good Samaritan story? I've heard many messages over the years. It could be that Jesus is interjecting some truth to a story accounting, but for the most part, I would say that it would be a parable, and many theologians would say the same. There's some, some thought about it, but it, to me, it's, hey, Jesus could do anything here, of course, in his teaching. This is what he does in verse number 33. He doesn't use another Jew. He uses a Samaritan. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. That verse right there, you could preach on for two hours, on Jesus Christ himself. Some of you are going, hmm, that's your homework for the week. For others, you have probably heard really tremendous Bible teaching on that. Think of it. He went to him. He bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Two types and pictures beautifully. The blood, the oil, the spirit, and the word. Look at how he heals him. He says, is there any more cost? I will make sure of the cost. I'll take care of it, the redemption the remuneration, the propitiation, Jesus paying all that needs to be paid. Verse 35, And on the morning, morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come, I will repay thee. Who repays all? Jesus. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, lawyer, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, the Samaritan, he doesn't say that, does he? He doesn't even mention the Samaritan by name in terms of his background. In this case, he says, he that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, I think you got it, go and do thou likewise. Powerful, powerful words right there, the mercy. Earlier who's my neighbor. At that point, when he recited the, the law of the great commandment, he should have said, I can't fulfill this. We'll get into that in a minute. He needs the mercy of the Lord. Verse 38, down to the end of the chapter. Here's now the reprove, the reproving, how Jesus reproves Martha. Now, it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha. Thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. You see the strong reproving of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's why we entitled our message today, Reprove. Let me read a simple blue letter concordance dictionary or simply put 
definition of the word reprove, to convict, to refute, to confute, generally with a suggestion of shame of the person convicted. By conviction, to bring to the light, to expose, to find fault with, to correct by word. That's not a popular word, is it? Other than to be critical. To reprove means to find the fault and to have it corrected. That's what the Word of God does. That's why I said earlier, would you not? I would rather have the Word of God do that to me. As we ask often in these type of settings, how many of you absolutely love having somebody tell you what to do? Come on, all of you do, right? I, ha I love Jesus telling me what to do. There, now we go. You see, today, just for a few minutes, I want you to lock into the idea of being reproved. And is it possible we run from it? I have learned in pastoring over many years that having someone reprove me is very much needed in my life. At first, you might want to stiffen up against it, like the lawyer who is my neighbor. You already know who your neighbor is. Like Martha. <laughs> Why, Jesus, aren't you getting Mary to help me pick up the place? I mean, Mary's got to be completely, completely out of your will, God, Jesus. And she's not. Is it important to have a nice home, a nice house cleaned up and taken care of and the people that are your guests? Absolutely. Jesus Christ is taught on that. But what's more important than Jesus Christ? She is reproved. So today, just for a few minutes, I, I just have you to consider the Samaritan story is tremendous. We're going to look at it, but from that side of, look at how Jesus is using this to reprove a man who's got the law down, or we would think he does. Has the Baptist church culture down? Has the Word of God been through discipleship 1 through 24? All of them. Right, Randy? The whole list gone through every theological class and they got, but he, Jesus, he reproves this lawyer and says, Jesus reproves Martha and says, there's some things that need to be in a better place in our lives. Maybe this Jesus style reprove is really, really important. Again, consider the setting. This man is a doctor and teacher of the law. He has a question. And Jesus Christ finds out where his heart's at in it. Jesus is going to say, okay, lawyer, we need some work. You need some work to be done. Servant, Martha, good to be in your house. So Lazarus, you know, the family kind of raised him from the dead a little bit, you know. <laughs> kind of like your home, it's all right. But sometimes we don't realize really what God wants to do in our lives. And he says, hey, I can reprove the best way, the right way, the good way. Four quick things. Let's walk through them, just spend a few minutes on seeing the reproving of Jesus Christ. First one, let's identify. Fake believers reproved. I believe this certain lawyer who stands up is a fake believer. How do I say that or define that? He, he believes something. He believes in the law. He believes in the Old Testament covenants. He believes in Scripture. He knows it enough to recite it. But he stands up and he tempts Jesus. You see, Jesus questioned the lawyer back. That's his reproof. Testing Jesus means the motivation of the heart is wrong. The master reproves the heart of people with truth about justification. What do you mean by that? 
Don't put the slide up yet, B, but let's go to Luke chapter number 18, and we'll just kind of work this one for about three or four minutes. What do you mean by this? There are, to me, fake believers that need to be reproved. And Jesus says, I'm evaluating your heart, Mr. Lawyer. I want to know your heart behind the question, which is, he can do that. He's Jesus. He's justifying himself, it says there. When he says in verse 29, willing to justify himself. So he's got a piece of self-justification. He sees himself righteous. I can do this at any time in my life I want to. I can justify myself for my actions, for my words. We can do that. We're like that lawyer. We realize, you know, like the lawyer did, the only way that I could possibly fulfill this law is to fall down on my knees and beg for mercy from Jesus because I can't do it. Remember the interaction that Jesus Christ had with Nicodemus? Nicodemus is a rabbi. Nicodemus is a Pharisee of Pharisees. And yet he says to him, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? Go back in. He talks about being born again. Go into the tummy of the mom again. No, no, no. You must be born of the water, the physical birth, and you must be born of the spirit. This setting right here shows us, as Jesus questions the lawyer, that there are many people that are saying, hey, I believe to a point, but I am not going to believe to really, really be a disciple and follower of Jesus Christ. It says in Luke 18, here's the text. It's up on the screen, verses 9 through 14. Some of you remember this parable. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous, despised others, were righteous, certain. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. Publican is a simple farmer type of person, a tax-paying person. He is just a common person. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Verse 12, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. That's a nice prayer, isn't it? <laughs> He's justifying himself, this Pharisee, like the lawyer is with Jesus. And the publican, verse number 13, standing far off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, I tell you. Jesus says, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Without going into Galatians 2 and Galatians 3, all you investors already got all that awesome teaching anyway. You understand that the law is brought to us by God to reveal how much we sin and need a Savior to forgive us of our sin. You can't do the law. You can't fulfill the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. And this lawyer is being completely reproved by Jesus because he has a self-justification problem. It does say in Galatians 3.21, you can put it in your notes and look it up later. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. This lawyer will not beg for mercy. But we sure hope when it comes to verse number 37 that he, as he's making that statement, there's a revelation there. There's a possibility that the bells and wishes and conviction and reproof are going on. And he says, hey, he that showed mercy on him, then Jesus said, go and do thou likewise. Whew. Fake believers need to be reproved. 
The second one I want you to see is in verse 30 through 35, going into Jesus' teaching. This is the side of it that I looked at by the Holy Spirit. False shepherds reproved. We looked at the fake believers. Now we look at the false shepherds. Jesus illustrated a lesson, right? The Good Samaritan. Position with Jesus means nothing to those in need when we do not care. Now I'll say that really slowly. A pastor with a title, a deacon with a title, a ministry leader with a title, an elder, a bishop, whomever. That position with Jesus and Jesus means nothing to those in need when we do not care. Doesn't mean a thing. The Lord reproves the heart of people with truth about compassion. Clearly, clearly, just in the historical content and the accounting by Luke, the Levite and the priest, they went on the other side. Do you think that the priest must have had a rough week? Maybe the Levite did too. The priest is busy at the temple. He's got to get the scripture ready for reading every single day. He's got to get the prayers ready. He's got to get everything for worship all taken care of. He's got to be so busy that when it comes to the need of this Jewish person who's half dead by scripture account in the ditch, he would walk on the other side. Maybe, maybe he thinks he's too dirty. Maybe he thinks that the thieves are around, the ones that attacked him, so he thinks it's really dangerous. I don't know. Or it'd be too much trouble. But the Levite follows him right along, and the Levite, what's he? He's just, a, he's just an assistant to the priest. He must have had a really tough week, too. So that's the way we get. And the Lord reproves the heart of people with truth about compassion. It's an unloving act to consider someone that's too dirty to minister to them. It's an unloving act, lacking compassion, to think that it's too difficult or too dangerous. And the priest and the Levite did that. And Jesus Christ illustrated a lesson to say, hey, your position as some great religious chief mucky muck of the temple, who knows about scripture, who has sacred rights, means nothing to those who are in need when you do not care. Go to 1 John chapter number 3. John and his writings help us out here. And there's much of this in 1 John. 1 John chapter number 3 verse 16 says this. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. I got no time to help on my brother in the Lord. I got no time. I am too busy. I am strapped out. Well, this obviously is not that case, because he's helping a person who we don't know if he's saved or lost or he's a Jew. And they're Jews and they're spiritual leaders. Who knows, he might even attend the temple and services and see this priest there of the other 23 to make 24 priests that handle all the required services that the priests do. Maybe he knows this Levite, but he can't see him because he's half dead. The Bible says in 1 John, as I continue to finish this up, that we shut up, his shut up his bowels of compassion, how dwelleth the love of God in him. My children, let us love in word, neither in tongue. Let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. I'm not even going to the list of passages in James and faith and works and all of that stuff. We're just looking at what Jesus is saying, and Jesus is saying enough, and Apostle John says enough, and Luke says enough, and the Scripture says enough that our position with Jesus means nothing if we are some spiritual leader or we have this spot. It's a false shepherding. We need to be reproved. How much work 
are we really doing as people that know Jesus Christ to influence our neighbors, our neighborhood, the people that are around us, the work that we ought to be doing because by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have a loved one for another. And that is still one of the greatest statements that Jesus made challenging his disciples that if you don't love each other, if a brother has a need and you shut up your bowels of compassion, then we need to be reproved. Thank you, God, for the reproof. Thank you, God, for reproving me. Now I need to make a decision on that because this is where it's coming to. The third thing simply fits right here. Faux neighbors exposed. I just spoke of them. Jesus commissioned the lawyer. Faux, pretend neighbors. The Bible says, love thy neighbor and stops. No. Love thy neighbor as what? Do you like yourself? Well, sometimes in my certain states I don't. But I think I'm still going to keep my office as the president of the Mark Brown fan club. I don't have any members. But I figure I could be the president, I could be like the whole board. I could, I could make myself the vice president. You see, the pretend neighbors being reproved means that these two men show us, even to the lawyer responding to Jesus, that the teaching from Jesus means a challenge to respond to his invitation. And I am supposed to love my neighbor as myself. We do love ourselves, the lives that we're given. And as a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, I need to look to the Lord and say, Lord, reprove my heart with the truth about the mission. Because if I love my neighbor as myself, and I love the Lord thy God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and really, what is he doing? Because the last few verses here in a moment are about loving the Lord first. That's the Mary and Martha part. This is about loving your neighbor as yourself part. And the fake, phony, faux neighbors that pretend that they're the neighbor that loves Let's just make sure we are realizing who these two guys are. Both of them know the law, just like the lawyer does. And they did not love that person on the other side of the road in the gutter. And we can preach it and teach it and go up and down and inside out and break out theology all day long on this. But boy, oh boy, how much more do I need? I'm reproof to my gut of how much I love myself more than I love my neighbor. Sacrifice needs to meet lip service. Jesus is coming after this discipleship stuff very seriously. He's saying it to the ones that followed him. And we know what one of them did, and we know the whole part about Peter. We know the whole story. Don't accept that that's okay. Be like John the Apostle, maybe, and Peter later on, and know that every one of us, as we read this stuff, go, wow. Luke 9 and Luke 10. They tell us about the mission. It's up on the screen. Don't need a whole lot of reminder of that. First verse of each one. Jesus sent them to preach the kingdom of God. Jesus sent the 70 also. To, he sent them out two and two to preach the gospel, to preach the kingdom of God is at hand. That's the mission. That's the reality. That's the truth. That the Lord reproves the heart of people with truth about the mission. The mission is to give people good news. You know what the good news is? 
I'm coming to you. I went to you. I bound up your wounds. I poured in oil and wine. I set you on your own beast. I brought you to an end. I took care of you, and I asked somebody else to take care of you. And when the bill had to be paid, I paid for the bill. Take care of him. And I'll be back later. And when I come again, sound familiar? We're reproved, all of us. And it's good for us. See, I like, again, I like God doing it. It's hard for me to hear from someone else. Sometimes I've got to hear it there too. Last one. It comes all to where I said just a minute ago about worship. And it comes into the place of communion. Communion and the Lord's Supper. Feigned worshipers. Same word, I just used four F synonyms, F words. Uh, that didn't come out right. I didn't, not that stuff, come on. Jeez. See, they didn't have that in the first century. You don't have to worry about that stuff. Feigned worshipers reproved. Jesus answered the servant. Let me read this and then look at this scripture for a moment and be done and set us all up for the Lord's Supper. Holy Spirit, please work. Priorities for Jesus mean an examination of all that's important to God. Having hospitality is important to God. Taking care of Jesus while he's at your house is important to God. But what is most important? The king reproves the heart of people with truth about communion. Communing with him is worship. To commune with him. They're in Bethany. Lazarus. <laughs> His family, boy, they, they know Jesus. Jesus loves them. And it was, when you see in verse 38 that it came to pass as they went, he entered into a certain village, and Martha received him into her house. The sister Mary's there, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Jesus had his disciples with him. He had a crowd with him. Others wanted to hear, but she got closest, didn't she? Verse number 40, Martha was cumbered about much serving. It's important. Came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Now he re reproves her. Bid her therefore that she help, and he answers. How does he answer? Martha, Martha, thou art careful. You worry. You're concerned. Thou art careful. Why don't you be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication? Oh, wait a minute. Paul wrote that to the church of Philippi. I got a little bit mixed up. And troubled about many things. You're, you're troubled. But one thing, you know, that's another that verse. That's a message for two hours. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, to commune with me, which shall not be taken away from her. Worship, you know. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, yes. Jesus, others, you. The definition of joy, I remember when I heard that first year I was saved or two. You want to have a life filled with joy? You want to ignite what the Holy Spirit can do to build the fruit in you? Jesus, others, you. No jokes, no snarky. It, that's, that's simple, but that's right. To love the Lord thy God. This reprove that Jesus gives is strong. I'm going to remind you of a favorite passage in where Jesus deals with a woman from Samaria. John 4, we'll finish up and tie this all together. John 4, many of you know what I'm going to read. Verses number 22 through 24 are up on the screen. John 4. When you go there, you know the text of what's going on there, the context of Jesus Christ. 
who coincidentally happened to run into <laughs> at the well, Jacob's well, of course. All that goes on here, but we pick it up in verse number 22. In verse number 21, we can even include, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall, ne ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. When you follow that and you get that reproof from Jesus that way, it's pretty solid. It puts me in a place where I realize that statement that I had in the, uh, in the slide before is, hey, the king reproves the heart of people with truth about what it means to commune with him, to commune and to be one with him. It's powerful to think of what this kind of consecration in our lives can be as we're reproved by the Word and by the Holy Spirit. It says in the last slide up there to get us ready for our communion for the Lord's Supper. When we are reproved by the words and deeds of the Lord Jesus Christ, we remember that He is all and all. He is our all and all. Let's allow His words to reprove us. Jesus spoke these words as we prepare our hearts to partake in the Lord's Supper. Why don't you go ahead and stand and start your own personal prayer with the Lord before we take the Lord's Supper with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, a time of prayer. There's going to be some music already starting in the background. I'm going to pray a little bit. And then I'd have you to come up and go down that aisle that's on the outer over there, there, and the split between the sections there. Come and get your elements. And then go back to your chair and sit and spend some time alone examining, preparing your heart to partake of the Lord's Supper, the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, thank you for your precious and holy word. Thank you for sending your son to be the sacrifice, the redemption, our all in all. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father, for loving us so much. Thank you, Jesus, for teaching the words of life in Scripture. It's so good, so, so good. I'm reproved. We're all reproved. And I consider right now in this time together with my brothers and sisters a very precious time unto you, holy God. Your name, Jesus, we extol and lift it up and totally and completely lay ourselves down and say, God, prepare our hearts as we prepare ourselves before you. Receive the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.